Hey guys, and welcome back to a new unit of civics and a new term of civics. You have officially made it through one third of the class. Congratulations. I am super happy for you. And overall, I am very impressed by the level, the quality of work I'm seeing, um, the, the hard work I'm seeing in general on all of your um, behalfs. I see how many hours you're logging in Canvas. I'm really impressed. Um, and, I, and I really wanna thank you for how hard you've been working so far. Um, this next six weeks is some of my favorite units. I'm super excited to get started. Um, and within the next six weeks, we also have a presidential election. So lots going on. I'm really looking forward to it. So without any further ado, let's get going. So let's start by kind of going over what you guys should already know, right? So the framers of the constitution wanted to have a, a constitutional voting body, a congressional voting body, right? And, and you, remember, you might remember there was a disagreement with how that representation should uh, happen. There were delegates from smaller states that wanted equal representation. And then of course, the delegates from larger states wanted representation to be based on population because that would give them a greater voice in government. Um, the Great Compromise, which we've talked about, uh, was Congress's solution. It gave us a bicameral uh, legis uh, legislative branch. So the legislative branch is the first article of the Constitution, and it is um, it is the most important branch of government. The framers made it that way. Uh, they saw it as the mo they wanted it to be more powerful because it, it is the branch that is closest to the people. And so they thought if there was any branch that could be in check by the people, it would be the legislative branch. And so they wanted it to be the most powerful. Um, really quick before we get going, I want you guys to do this little matching game. It's just a review um, of some of the principles of democracy that we covered a few weeks ago, just to kind of um, jog your memory a little bit. And if you have any confusion about these, there's still the Nearpod that goes into principles of democracy available on Canvas for you guys to look at. So what is a bicameral legislature? Well, all it really means is two houses. It's a two house Congress. So we have the House of Representatives, which is the lower house and the US Senate, which is the upper house. The US Senate is equal representation no matter what size your state is. So if you have the smallest state in the union, you have two senators. And if you are the largest state in the union, you also have two senators. That's the US Senate. The other house is the House of Representatives. The House of Representatives is based on population um, and that uh, there are a lot more people in the House of Representatives and it is the considered the lower house. So let's go into some details about the Senate. Um, so the Senate has 100 members because if every state has two and we have 50 states, then spoiler alert, two times 50 is 100. I mean, I know this isn't math class, but hold on to your pants. So the Senate has 100 members, two from each state. Each Senator represents his or her entire state, not a district. So if you are a Senator from North Carolina, you represent all of North Carolina, not just part of North Carolina. Uh, senators serve six year terms, um, but the elections are staggered. So it's not every six years we reelect all 100 senators. Um, we stagger it every two years. So a third of the Senate is reelected every two years. So that way it's not every two years, all this turmoil of everyone wanting to, or every six years rather, of everyone trying to be uh, run their campaigns all at the same time especially in the Senate race, that would um, nothing would get done in the, in the Senate if that was true. So they make it so that only a third of the senators are uh, up for um, re-election every two years. Uh, it kind of it ensures a sense of stability and continuity in, in the Senate. So uh, if a senator dies or resigns before their term, the state legislature and the governor actually point the vacancy, which you would be able to see in an example if we were gonna be able to watch Mr. Smith goes to Washington if we were still in school, but we aren't, which is unfortunate. But I highly suggest you guys watch Mr. Smith goes to Washington. It is such a great old time movie and it's super informative. You learn a lot about the legislative process in the, pop, in the process. Um, I, I highly recommend it. So check out this guy. This guy is James Storm. So he, well, if you look here, let me open up a web page. So 
first of all, he lived to be, what is that, 101 years old, which is incredibly impressive. But if you notice, he was a senator in 1950, right? Um, he was a center basically for, I think it was over 40 years. Like I'm not gonna do the math right now because that's a lot, but you can see all of the different times that he was elected to office and how how long he was in office. So he was in office for like 40 something, 50 years. If you wanna go through and do the math, you can. There were times where he took breaks, um, but he was in office for like an incredible period of time. So like, just think about that. Like if you are president, right, you, um, you only get eight years, 10 years at most. And we'll talk about that next week. But like you, you have a certain amount of time you're allowed to be in office, but for a Senator and for a member of the house of representatives, you literally can be in office for as long as you can, as long as you can hold out. I want you to think about that. What do you think of, of, of the fact that senators, uh, and house representatives can be in, in office for as long as they want? Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Um, you know, it, it depends on your per, on your perspective. Um, each side has good arguments. So let's do the House of Representatives and go into some more detail for that. Uh, so the House of Representatives is a way larger body than the Senate. The Senate only had 100 people and the House of Representatives has 435. Um, and all of them are allotted to the states via population. So the constitution guarantees that no matter how tiny your state is or how few people live there, no matter what, you get at least one member of the House of Representatives. Um, our state has 15 as of right now, which we probably will get more from the census because we are a growing state for population. Um, I'll talk about the census in a minute, but basically every 10 years, including this year, uh, we take a census, which is literally just counting all of the people in our country um, and trying to tally up how many people we have. And we do that in order to figure out how many members of the House of Representatives we're allowed to have. So like if our population goes down, maybe we lose a representative because the House of Representatives is based on population, right? It has to be evenly distributed. But North Carolina is one of those states where the population is rising. Um, so that actually, uh, is good for us because we're going to end up having probably an extra member added. Um, we just take from the same pool of 435 members, so we haven't added any extra people to the actual house in a while. Um, of course, it does happen when we add states, we have to add more members, but right now we're at 435 and it doesn't seem like we're changing anytime soon. Um, but of course, if we have a new state, like if Puerto Rico becomes a state, we might end up having additional members added. Um, Let's see. So why don't we just go over some leadership in the House while we're here. So there, in both the House and the Senate, there are political parties that have more than half of the members. If you have more than half of the members in your political party, you are part of the majority party. If you're part of the other party that doesn't have more than half the members, you are a part of the minority party. Um, at the beginning of each term, the party members choose leaders to direct their activities. So the leader of the house is the, um, is the speaker of the house is what her, she's called. Um, and it is Nancy Pelosi. She is the presiding officer of the house and the leader of the majority party. So she is a Democrat, which means that the majority party in the house is the democratic party. Um, the speaker has a lot of power. They steer legislation through the house. They lead debates. Um, if anything happened to the vice president or the president, the speaker is actually next in line to be president. So Nancy Pelosi is number three in terms of, um, of becoming president, right? So if both Trump and Pence pass away, then she would be, well, they'd have to pass away at the same time. It would be a pretty tragic incident, but she would be president. Um, the speaker also relies on their powers of persuasion. They have a big platform. People know who they are. People are more likely to listen to. So they use that platform in order to try and steer legislation um, through power of the people, right? Trying to convince people that the legislation she wants to get through is, is what we need. Uh, so that is a little bit about the um, speaker of the house. So let's now move to leadership in the Senate. So it is closely related to leadership in the House, but the Senate does not have a speaker. There's only a speaker of the House. The vice president is actually the leader of the Senate, but he's not usually there. Like 
Mike Pence does not hang out on the Senate floor all day long and listen to legislation. He's doing other things. Actually, the vice president a lot of times is is uh, overseas. A lot of times the vice president does diplomatic things, so they're not even in the country. Um, but uh, technically, they are the leader of the Senate. When they aren't there, the guy who sits in for them is someone called the president pro temp. Um, it's just, it's pro pro temp meaning for the time being, they don't actually have any power except for to kind of like control the Senate floor. So like they're the guy with the gavel who, who tells everyone who's allowed to speak. Um, but they're, they're only, they're literally the oldest member of majority party. Um, not oldest age, but oldest in, uh, how long they've been there. So whatever person in the party has been there the longest, like of the majority party, that's who the president pro tem is. So, I mean, it's, it's not even like you have to really earn it. Um, so here's some other congressional officials. I have a video after this slide that helps you with this. Um, but both the house and the Senate have their majority leaders and minority leaders. Um, just the people who lead the party, uh, in the Senate and the House, that's easy enough. And then there's also something called a majority and minority party whip. So their job is to try and whip up votes, which is why that's what they're called. So if you are a member of the Democratic Party, um, you're going to have the majority whip or the minority whip trying to convince you to vote along with your party because nothing can get done unless the party all votes in the same line. Um, and that's their whole job. They have to whip up votes to try and get legislation to cross. Usually these people are going to be people that people like, right? They're going to, if you're going to have someone whose job it is to try and persuade other people to vote along with you, you need to be a persuasive type person. So they're not going to choose someone that no one likes to be a party with. It's going to be a more popular, knowledgeable member of the House or the Senate. Congressional leadership, this goes into more detail about what I just covered. I highly suggest you watch every single video I have in here. They, the crash course kills it on the legislative branch. They do a great job. They cover so much stuff. Um, they, they, they kick butt. So I put a lot of those videos in here and I really encourage you to watch them, especially if there's any parts of what I go over today that confuse you, just go back to the videos and watch that. And maybe they'll explain it in a way that, that you'll understand a bit better. Constituent. So here's a vocab word for you, basically. So what is a constituent? Constituent is the person, um, the people who a member of Congress represents. So I am President Donald Trump's constituent. Technically, anyone who is in the United States and who is, a, I mean, a, I guess a citizen, and even people who aren't citizens are, no, nah, if you're a voting citizen, you're a constituent, right? Um, the people who, who help put you into office. I am a constituent of North Carolina senators, right? Tom Tillis, um, who is up for re-election. I am his constituent. I'm a constituent of the um, District 9, which is where I live, uh, House of Representative member. So it's whoever represents me, right? So uh, the Senate, if you're a senator, you represent your entire state. If you're a member of the House, you don't represent your state. You do represent a specific part of your state. Um, like Wake County isn't necessary. It's, it's Wake County is basically one of the districts. Um, not entirely. There's, it's, it's split into a couple, but, uh, so if you are the house of representatives, uh, member for that district, that's the people you represent. You don't represent all of the country. You don't represent all of the state. You represent your district. So you are there in office to, um, help the people who put you there the most. You are, you are, you are their spokesperson. You are their fighter. Uh, the only person who is an elected office who has every citizen as a constituent is president and technically vice president, but they're on the same ticket. Um, everyone else has a smaller number of constituents. So here's the census. I have a video after this, which is actually from one of my favorite shows called West Wing, which explains the census. But basically I talked about it earlier. It's population count. Every 10 years we have to count how many people are in each state. And it's really, really important. And it's really important to fill out your census. It's really important to be part of it because um, if, if you're not, then you're actually hurting your own state. You're hurting your own, your own interest. Uh, we want to have as many people um, accounted for as possible in our state so that our, we get more representation in Congress. Um, and so that's happening right now, which is actually crazy that the census is happening during COVID 
nuts because the census is so complicated and takes forever. Think about it. We have to count every person in our country. It takes a minute. Um, and the fact that COVID's happening during it is crazy town. But luckily, um, we have, they've planned for safeguards. A lot of it is mail-in. They don't have as many face-to-face -face people going and counting. In the old days, that's how you had to do it. So like there was no online in the 1700s and, and mail service was barely even reliable. Do you know how they counted people? You had census counters. You had people whose job it was to go door to door and knock and say, hey, how many people live here? Thank you. And then count up the number of people. Like that is horrible. Um, we're, so it's a little bit better than it used to be. Uh, but that's basically what the census is for. Oh yeah, here's the video clip from West Wing explaining the census. Um, and that's Rob Lowe. And if you don't know who Rob Lowe is, maybe you do from the show Parks and Rec, um, or if you have a mom who really liked Rob Lowe in the old days, but yeah. Okay, so who draws congressional districts? Um, basically, the state legislature draws districts. But what's interesting is that we actually have a very interesting state in North Carolina to study in terms of gerrymandering. So gerrymandering is uh, basically when a congressional district is drawn to directly favor one party over another. And it happens when a state legislature is either majority Democrat or majority Republican and they can get away with it because the state legislature is allowed to draw them so they can get away with it. Um, gerrymandering, it's called that because of a person in Maine, I think it was in Maine, who drew a really wonky district that was described as looking like a quote salamander and the guy's name was Jerry and so they named it gerrymander, like a salamander. Um, all it is is an oddly shaped district designed to increase voting for a particular group. Uh, so for example, if most of the state's representation representatives are Republican, they might draw a line so that districts favor Republicans more than Democrats. Okay, that's really confusing and I get it. Gerrymandering is one of those things that takes a minute to really understand how it works. This video does a really, really cool job of, of simplifying it and kind of showing you how it's possible to favor one uh, group over the other clearly unfairly, right? So, and here's an example. So this, is, and we get to use North Carolina. And in this example, it shows both Republicans and Democrats being buttheads. So it's not one party or another doing this. Both parties are political buttheads and do things like this, unfairly try and affect elections. So if you look at the 2012 map here, the Republicans overall, if you look at North Carolina, won 49% of the vote. So it's a close election. We have a swing state. We live in a state where like we have, a, we're pretty half and half in terms of, of Republican and Democrat, which is kind of interesting to me. It makes it more exciting during election time. But so this year, Republicans won 49%, but they won nine seats to Democrats four because of how the districts were drawn. Because of how the districts were drawn, the Republicans were able to dilute the Democrat vote to the point where they had less um, representation. And in 2010, right here, we see that the Republicans actually had 54% of the vote. So the Republicans clearly won, right, um, in terms of how many people voted for them. But because of how the districts were set up, they only got six seats to the Republicans' seven seats, or to the Democrats' seven seats. So the Democrats still got more seats, even though they had less of the vote, just because of how the districts were drawn. Um, it's something that has been to the Supreme Court. It's something that is is a really big issue right now. We pace, we basically all we know is that it's illegal if it can be proved that it's a racial drawing. But other than that, it's been really difficult to pin down any state legislature on having unfair drawing districts. Most of the time, if if, the, if a court finds a drawing unfair, they'll just make the state districts redraw it, and that can take forever. Uh, North Carolina has been forced to redraw over and over again in the past because um, we are notorious for being like, look at this, look at this blue line. What is that? Like you'd assume a district would be like, you know, a square over here and a square over here. I mean, they all have to be represented equally by population, all of the districts. And that's pretty much their only rule. So what they did here was there's a highway right here and it has um, 
And this whole population right around this highway is very heavily minority, heavily uh, African-American, heavily Hispanic. Um, and historically, those groups vote Democrat. So by putting them all in this tight little line right here, all you're doing is ensuring that there's one Democrat Democratic seat and you're taking all of these Democratic votes away from the Republicans. I'm not even probably doing a great job of explaining it. It is confusing. Um, if you watch the video that's on this slide before, it might make more sense. But all you really need to know is that it's a way of unfairly drawing representation, of trying to give your party an advantage over another by drawing uh, districts to be all wonky. And so, yeah, that's gerrymandering. So I do want you to give me your thoughts on gerrymandering. Um, do you think, how bad do you think they are? How good do you think they are? Uh, consider the influence of gerrymandering on our ideals of what democracy is. All right, so now we're gonna take a little bit of a different approach now. We're gonna talk about committees, congressional committees. So each House of Congress has to look through thousands of bills. Um, a bill is a proposed law uh, during a course of a session. In order to make it possible for them to actually handle all of these bills at the same time, they've developed a system of committees. So congressional committees um, come in three types. The first and most important is a standing committee. Uh, standing committees are permanent committees and they have them in both the House of Representatives and the Senate. And some examples are um, ones that deal with agricultural interests, commerce, veterans affair, armed services committee, budget committee. So basically anytime a new bill is introduced, um, they determine which committee makes more sense for it to look at and that committee looks over the bill. That way, um, not everyone is looking over the, every single bill that comes through and they delegate it to certain uh, committees. Then there are select committees. So the House and Senate sometimes deal with temporary issues that are, that are still important but, and have to be dealt with. And so they have to make these uh, select committees. So they exist for a limited time until the assignment is completed. So like there was a select committee on 9-11. So like after 9-11 happened, Congress in both House and the Senate had specific people looking into bills that had spe that specifically had to do with 9-11, um, which of course that, that committee didn't exist before then because that would have been weird. Um, but, and the committee doesn't exist now because um, 9-11, you know, is, wow, a long time ago. Um, so that committee doesn't exist anymore. Then there are joint committees. So joint committees are interesting because it actually includes members of both the House and the Senate. Um, and it's when they uh, come together to meet on very specific issues. It's very similar to a conference committee, um, except a conference committee is pretty much when the they've had a bill in the House and the Senate and it keeps going back and forth because they keep like rewording very slightly certain things about the bill. And so they meet and like have a conference so they can actually iron out the finer wording. That's a conference committee. It's pre pretty much like the last stand of, OK, let's get this ironed out. Let's get this finished so that we can send it to the president to become a law. You have I have a whole other Nearpod note presentation that goes into the details of how a bill becomes a law. Um, so that is. Uh, and I mean, if you've ever seen you know, I'm just a bill, I have that video in there if you haven't, so don't worry, but that's um, a whole other group of notes. So how are congressional committees assigned? So when a senator or a representative first comes to Congress, they try and get into the most important committees that they can. So like important committees would be the ones that probably affect the most people or have the most um, attention. So they might, um, okay, so like if you are a representative from Iowa, maybe you wanna be on a committee that has to do with agriculture because a lot of your constituents and the people who put you in office are farmers and would appreciate you uh, being on a committee that dealt with legislation that directly affected their lives, right? So sometimes um, those are that's a really good match. A lot of times they try and uh, put you in committees that you do have an interest in but mostly they do it based on the seniority system. So if you're a noob, you get put in the professional committee of, of toilets, which is unfortunate. There's no committee of toilets. But like that's, I mean, because no one else wants to be there. If you've been there for a while, you're in a better, uh, you're going to be in a better committee. So party leaders 
make the committee assignments. So you guys just watched that video about party leadership. Those people are the ones who, who actually make committee assignments. Um, and in doing so, they consider members' preferences, experience, loyalty to the party, and seniority or years of service. Um, the senators and representatives who have been in Congress longest usually get their preferred committee spots. Um, the longest serving committee member from the majority party usually becomes the chairperson of that committee. So they have even more power because the chairperson decides if and when a committee meets, what bills are studied, who gets to serve on the subcommittees, and almost always seniority is, is used for whoever becomes a chairperson. Some people like the seniority system. They think it's a good idea. They say it prevents fights over committee jobs and it makes sure that at least the chairperson has experience. But other people complain that like more talented people who are coming in who might be better at this job aren't being chosen in favor of those who've just been around for a while. Um, there's been a lot of criticism over the seniority system over the years. Uh, and although like political parties have moved slightly away from it, it's still definitely a, a main way in which um, people are chosen for their committee assignments. So here is my boo, my boo doing his congressional committee um, video and he does such a good job. Really, really suggest you watch it. And it, what really makes it helpful to watch these videos is the fact that they have the animation that kind of goes into like that shows you in like a, a picture form what we're talking about, which is super helpful. So really, really watch these videos. All right, so let's do the powers of Congress. So most of the powers delegated to Congress are called enumerated powers, also known as expressed powers. You'll see it written either way. If you see expressed powers, it's the same as enumerated powers and vice versa. They are the same thing. Um, so those are all outlined in Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. Uh, there are 18 separate powers specifically given to Congress. Um, an example of one is an obvious one. There's the Congress has the power to coin money. So Congress has the power to coin, meaning literally create physical money, like they can make cash. Um, that's one of their powers. But then uh, there are certain powers that are not specifically given in the Constitution. And so how, right, because I mean, you, you should know this. There's not only 18 things that Congress can do. They've made bills about a bajillion things, right? They haven't just made bills about 18 different things. Um, so how have they been able to do that? Well, there's a clause, clause 18, in the Constitution that is called the Necessary and Proper Clause. Um, it basically says that just because the power is not actually stated in the Constitution doesn't mean that Congress doesn't have it. There are powers that are, quote, implied powers, um, which is a power that uh, Congress has if they need to do something in order to fulfill one of their other powers. Um, so for example, Congress has the power to tax and collect tax money. Cool. So is, are, do you expect a Senator to go door to door to pick up tax money? No, of course not. So an implied power of Congress is to make the IRS, the internal revenue system. They created a branch of government that deals with taxes on its own because, um, it is implied that in order to do their job of collecting taxes, they need assistance from, a, a, you know, more people, they need help. So they, there's an implied power that they can create the IRS. Does that make sense? Um, this is known as the elastic clause because it stretches the power. It kind of is like a loophole to ensure that in case Congress needs a power, they can kind of give it to themselves. Um, but you can't just, they can't just do anything. They have to explain why the power is necessary because of one of their other 18 powers, right? Um, just like the example I just gave where it's collecting taxes and the IRS, you have to you have to make that connection. They can't just come out of thin air with the power that they need. Um, the Khan Academy, this is actually, you have an uh, assignment this week that goes into it, but um, this goes into more detail about the enumerated uh, powers of the Constitution and really in what the implied powers are and more about the necessary and proper clause. X, ugh. Excellent video, and it's not too long, especially for Khan Academy, only six minutes. Um, super duper informative. All right, let's do some checks and balances. So checks and balances is different than separation of powers. 
I want to say that again. Checks and balances is different than separation of powers. Separation of powers means what it says. Every branch of government has a different job to do. That's all that means. But checks and balances is part is written into the Constitution and is a way for one branch to literally check and make sure that another branch is not becoming too powerful. And it's it's in order to balance out the branches. Um, every branch has a check on every other branch, at least one check. So here are some examples. Here are checks that the legislative branch has over the executive branch. So although the president can appoint people to his cabinet, they have to be approved by the legislative branch. Same goes for treaties. Um, the legislative branch, Specifically, the House has the power to impeach and the Senate has the power to remove the president. That's another pre uh, check on the executive branch. Um, so if the executive branch is starting to get out of control, Congress can kick them out, right? President's getting crazy. You can kick them out. That is within their uh, um, power. And then although the president writes the budget every year, Congress has to approve it. So that is yet again another power over the president another check on the president and his power. So then we have the judicial branch. So um, the president does appoint Supreme Court and judges to the federal uh, court, and they all have to be approved by the legislative branch. That is one check on the judicial branch. No judge is gonna make it to a federal bench without being approved by Congress. Um, and just like uh, Congress can impeach presidents, they can also impeach and remove judges. So if a judge is not doing what they're supposed to be doing, they can be impeached. Um, technically, uh, so the judicial branch, their whole job is to make sure that things are constitutional. So one check that the legislative branch has on the judicial branch is that they can change the constitution. So the second that something is an amendment and put in the constitution, it is now, of course, constitutional. So that changes the um, the judicial, the way the judicial branch works. So like, for example, if there was an amendment that said um, same-sex marriage is, is legal no matter what, that's a horribly written amendment, <laughs> but if that's what it said, there could never be another judge that did not side with same-sex marriage, right? Because, um, because it, it is constitutional, it's written right there. That's kind of uh, the check that the legislative branch has on the judicial branch. So here's what impeachment means. Impeach just means to accuse an official of misconduct. Um, these are the three presidents who have been impeached. Um, none of them have been removed. So like impeach does not mean removed. I feel like a lot of people learned that in the last year or two, but um, people always assume that, oh, he was impeached. It means he has to leave. No, impeach just means that like the House of Representatives accused you of doing something wrong. Um, and just like a regular trial, when someone accuses you of something, you go to um, court, technically, right? And the president's court, quote unquote, is the Senate. And the Senate determines whether or not you get removed. And the Senate has never determined that anyone um, should be removed from office. Uh, Donald Trump, Johnson, um, Clinton, um, all have been impeached. No one has ever been removed from office. So here are some limits on congressional power. Um, the Constitution explains like not only what Congress may do, but what it can't do. Uh, that was something the framers were really wanted to emphasize. You know, we, we have to make sure that the government is limited. Uh, some limitations are imposed in the Bill of Rights, right? That's the whole purpose of the Bill of Rights was to limit or to deny certain powers of, from the federal government. For example, Congress can't pass laws that restrict freedom of speech or ban freedom of religion, right? That's all in the Bill of Rights. Um, and there's more though. According to Article One of the Constitution, Congress also cannot favor one state over another. Um, they can't tax interstate commerce, right? So if it's state, uh, in between state trade, you can't tax that. They can't tax exports. It forbids Congress from enacting laws that would interfere with legal rights of individuals. Um, they cannot suspend the writ of habeas corpus right here. That's very Latin. Um, literally means uh, the writ of habeas corpus. It's something about body. I think it's called, it's like displaying body or like something like that. What it means is um, you are 
you're allowed to know why you're being arrested, right? The, the police has to tell you why you're being arrested. They can't just arrest you, put you in a cell and say, you know what you did and walk away. Like they have to tell you what it is that they're accusing you of doing. So like Congress can't stop that from happening. Um, they also can't pass a bill of attainer, which basically just means uh, a bill of attainer is just a punishing a person without a trial. You can't do that. Um, and they also can't pass ex post facto laws. So an ex post facto law is a law that makes an act a crime after the law's already been committed. So like they can't make, a, make something illegal and then um, find everyone who did it before it was illegal and, and charge them with it, right? That's not, that's not how that works. It's actually why um, when they changed the drinking age from 18 to 21, my dad was like 19 or 20 at the time, but because he had already, it was already legal for him to drink at that time, like when he started, he was allowed to keep drinking. So like it didn't stop he, just because he was 20 or 19 or whatever, when that law was made, he still was legally allowed to drink because it was an ex post facto law. He was already, when they made that law after he was already legally allowed to drink. And so that's not how that works. Everyone after that point had to wait to be 21. So if you were like, if it was like the next day you turned 18, you were probably livid because you weren't allowed uh, to drink until you were 21. Um, but that's kind of an example of like ex post, ex post facto law. Um, so here are some checks on congressional power, right? More limitations. So the legislative branch's entire job is to make laws. That's like, that is pretty much their job. Um, they have to make legislative decisions. Uh, but the president can veto laws. Every single law that gets passed through Congress goes to the president's desk and he can either sign it or veto it. And vetoing it literally means reject, right? Say no, no to whatever it is. Like big veto stamp picture, like a big red veto stamp on top of the law. I don't think it actually looks like that, although that would be neat. So the president has that power, that's a check. Um, and the president is the only one who can send troops in the battle. The way, reason that matters is because only Congress can formally declare war, but the president, because he is the commander of chief, can send the troops in a battle. So that's a way of taking military power and splitting it between branches. The president definitely has more say, I would say, over the military, unless you count um, funding, because funding comes from Congress. It's called power of the purse. Uh, but because the president is commander in chief, he does get to send troops to battle. So then um, the Supreme Court can check what the legislative branch can do because if the legislative branch passes a law and that law ends up in the Supreme Court, they can declare it unconstitutional. So that's a way to check um, the powers of uh, the legislative branch. So here is my, my boo doing checks and balances. Um, again, super informative. I know that these notes are long, but, but the legislative branch is complicated and I want to make sure you guys have as much information as you can moving forward. Uh, keep in mind what I cover specifically and what I talk about specifically is probably the most important. So if there's some stuff that maybe they go into a lot of detail for, it's still super interesting and does help you understand it, but it's not something you have to know for the rest of your life. Right. Um, so just, just put that out there. So then what else do they do? So yes, they make laws, but what else do they do? Well, they're a voice for their constituents. If you were put in office by a group of people, they expect you to represent them with their interest. You are supposed to go to Congress and speak on behalf of the people you represent. That is a huge responsibility as a congressman. And one of, I would argue, the most important thing that congressmen have to do. Um, but there's other stuff as well. There's something called casework. So Members of Congress often act as like troubleshooters for people in their home districts and in their state who need help dealing with federal government. Um, mostly the people who deal with casework will not be like the, the representatives themselves. It would be someone who worked for the representative or worked for the senator. But over the course of a year, I mean, some congressional offices receive as many as like 10,000 requests for additional services. And that all falls under casework. Um, because these people, you, you, if you are a member of Congress, you represent a group of people who put you in office. You are there to help them. That is why you are there. So part of it is helping them get by all the ridiculous federal, federal paperwork they may have to fill out for any given reason. Um, it's, it, it, you're there to be helpful. It's, it's kind of like being a teacher. I see it as like a calling. You want to be there to help people. And if you don't, then you're not doing the job right. Um, and that's, that's true for this next one. So public works. 
every year, like through different bills, Congress gives billions, literally billions of dollars to local projects. So we want a representative to go in there and argue that our county needs whatever money it needs because we need to build this dam. We need we needed this military base. We need more uniforms for this military base. We need um, these highways, these inner uh, state highways need to be fixed, right? Public works programs, um, we can be funded by the uh, federal government. We just have to make an argument for why it's something really necessary. Sometimes they are, we are, representatives could say, we really need jobs. We need more money to go to this district. This district is hurting for X, Y, and Z reasons, right? And that's how they get money um, put toward uh, their state. Unfortunately though, like um, there are things called pork barrel projects right here in the middle. So pork barrel projects are government projects and grants that primarily benefit the home district of a state and it's kind of like adding a lot of adding the fat meaning like adding money to government budget so like oops no all right bear with me we're so close to done too man all right so Pork barrel projects are adding the fat to government budget. It basically just means getting a ton of money sent for small projects in a small district unnecessarily in order just to, to throw money at, at your district unnecessarily. And that's called a pork barrel project. Uh, so what are some other things? We got grants and contracts. So another responsibility of congressmen is that they are lawmakers, right? So they try and ensure that their district or their state get a fair share of available federal grants and contracts funded through the federal uh, budget. Uh, federal grants and contracts are very important to lawmakers and their districts or their states. Uh, they're a crucial source of money, crucial, crucial uh, source of jobs. They greatly affect our economy and that is part of their job. Um, and then of course, lawmaking. Um, they represent the wishes and opinions of their constituents in the lawmaking process. It is their job to not only help create legislation that is good for you know, the country as a whole, but particularly good for the people that represent them. And that is something that their constituents want. Um, and luckily we have a way of keeping our legislative branch in check because we can vote them out of office. If they're not doing what we want, well, guess what? You're not gonna be there very long, are you? Um, and that's another check on the legislative branch as well, because no one's there forever. Uh, so yeah, that does it for us for the legislative branch. Keep in mind, you guys do have another Nearpod. There's no lecture that goes along with it because it's just short, but there are a couple videos that help you. And it just goes over the, you know, when a bill is introduced, how does it become a law? Um, and yes, of course, you get to watch I'm Just a Bill because it wouldn't be a civics class without it. Um, all right, guys, that's it for now. Thank you so much.